and welcome to the EHE Quarterly Stakeholder Webinar. My name is Kay Hayes, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS, and also the Acting Director for the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. I would like to welcome you all here today for our third EHE Quarterly Stakeholder Webinar of 2021. We are so happy you have been able to join us. While we continue to face tremendous challenges for COVID-19 and ramp up our vaccination efforts, it is also critical to continue to fight the end the HIV epidemic. As we will address all these issues, concurrent epidemics of viral hepatitis, sexually transmitted diseases, infections, and substance use disorders. On today's webinar, we will focus our attention on harm reduction models including syringe services programs or SSPs. SSPs are community-based prevention programs that can provide a range of services and they provide a lifeline to those struggling with substance abuse. Comprehensive SSPs offer patients vaccinations and testing for diseases, referrals to treatment for substance use disorder and other diseases such as viral hepatitis and HIV and sterile injection equipment to prevent the transmission of infectious diseases. Today's webinar will provide insights from several speakers on ways to improve and scale up and use harm reduction models, including SSPs. There will be also an opportunity for questions and answer from community members and government officials. I would like to introduce our first speaker, Ms. Regina Labelle who serves as Deputy Director for the Office of National Drug Control Policy, referred to as ONDCP, and currently serving as Acting Director of National Drug Control Policy. As Acting Director, Ms. LaBelle leads a component of the Executive Office of the President, whose mission is to reduce substance use and its consequences by leading and coordinating the nation's national drug control strategy. Acting Director LaBelle was sworn in on the evening of Inauguration Day and is regarded as an expert in drug policy. Prior to joining ONDCP, Ms. LaBelle served as a distinguished scholar and program director of the Addiction and Public Policy Initiative at Georgetown University's Law Center's O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. At the O'Neill Institute, Ms. LaBelle's work focused on the addiction epidemic, public health approaches to drug policy, and using the law to promote access to treatment and support recovery. Ms. LaBelle also founded and directed the Master of Science in Addiction Policy and Practice Program at Georgetown University. During the Obama administration, Ms. LaBelle served as ONDCP Chief of Staff where she oversaw the agency's efforts to address the opioid epidemic and other drug policy issues, including the implementation of the National Drug Control Strategy. Ms. LaBelle also served as legal counsel to Seattle Mayor Greg Nichols, providing legal and policy advice to the mayor on high profile city initiatives. And from 1998 to 2005, Ms. LaBelle was an adjunct professor of policy and ethics at Seattle University's Institute for Policy Studies. Ms. LaBelle received her JD from Georgetown University Law Center and was an undergraduate degree uh, from Boston College. She's an active member of the Washington State Bar. It is my pleasure and honor, and now I will turn the virtual mic, as they say, over to Ms. Regina LaBelle. Welcome. Thanks so much for that introduction. And I'm uh, so appreciative to be here this afternoon to speak with all of you about your important work. Um, I know that this uh, audience um, has many well-informed members and includes advocates who've been working for many, many years to improve the health and safety of underserved communities, as well as the health of people who use drugs. So from the Office of National Drug Control Policy, I wanna offer our support in your efforts to end the HIV epidemic which we know has been linked with the overdose epidemic and injection drug use over the last several years. We have a shared responsibility to end both of these epidemics. 
Um, CDC's data that overdose data that came out today uh, reports more than 93,000 Americans died from a drug overdose in 2020. That's the highest number of overdose deaths ever recorded. In addition to this heartbreaking overdose death rates, HIV outbreaks are occurring in many parts of the country. This is often connected to the lack of availability of sterile syringes and the sharing of syringes among people who inject drugs. Overdose deaths and other consequences such as HIV outbreaks underscore the challenges that we face. And to meet those challenges, we have to make full use of the evidence-based tools we know can connect people to care and protect the health and safety of people who use drugs. You all know that harm reduction is well-researched and an effective way to reduce bloodborne disease, but community opposition and a lack of understanding of the benefits of syringe services programs often stand in the way of sound policies and practices, such as those offered by syringe services programs. Last month, I visited a Baltimore syringe program as part of our announcement about lifting the federal restrictions on the use of fentanyl test strips at the program, I was so moved by the commitment of the staff to the health of every person who visited the site. Each person was treated with respect and dignity by the syringe program workers. And if you're treated with that type of respect and dignity, you're much more likely to return and ask for help. Every person who visits an SSP deserves respect. Every time I hear about a community or a county that's considering closing their SSP, I grow very concerned and worry about the people who use those services. Where are they going to turn to find healthcare with dignity? But I also grow concerned about the community who may never visit a syringe program because spikes in overdose deaths and HIV diminish the health of the entire community. ONDCP will continue to work in coordination with the Department of Health and Human Services and other federal partners to increase the understanding of the work of SSPs advocating for increased funding and to remove the obstacles and restrictions that reduce the effectiveness of these programs. We know it's essential to scale up SSPs to meet the great need in urban, suburban, and rural communities in our country. So as you may know, on April 1st, we released the Biden-Harris administration's statement of drug policy priorities for year one, and they include a focus on the full continuum of care, including evidence-based prevention, treatment, recovery and harm reduction, as well as advancing racial equity issues in our approach to drug policy. Specifically highlighted in these priorities document is support for evidence-based harm reduction interventions. And these interventions include providing people with the overdose antidote naloxone, sterile syringes, fentanyl test strips, and testing for HIV and hep C. These are simple things that can make a huge difference in someone's life and health. The difficult reality is that although these benefits are well understood by public health professionals who work on these issues, confusion remains about what harm reduction really means. By including harm reduction in our national priorities and in the national drug strategy next year for the first time, we increase public awareness about harm reduction so communities understand the benefits of these programs. ONDCB is already engaging with Congress to remove barriers to, to harm reduction services, including the ban on federal funds to purchase syringes. And as part of the American Rescue Plan, President Biden identified $30 million for harm reduction funding. This funding was historic for two reasons. It was the first time harm reduction services were specifically included with their own funding stream, and the American Rescue Plan uh, funding for these services can be used to purchase sterile syringes. In addition to this funding, the president's new budget proposal for fiscal year 2023 includes over $10 billion to expand access to prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery support services. These funds indicate the urgent effort to build out the type of addiction infrastructure that's so lacking in our country. Also, in collaboration with our interagency partners, ONDCP is drafting the first national drug control strategy of the Biden administration, which will be released next February. And, I'm, and I, we're just at the start of this process, but we're looking to increase funding for harm reduction services, update Good Samaritan and drug paraphernalia state laws to protect those who work for harm reduction programs. We're gonna discuss expanding the range of services that SSPs offer, 
and support for more pre-arrest diversion of and reduction in justice involvement for people who use drugs. We're encouraged by the support and partnership we've already received from HHS, as well as from the Office of National AIDS Policy, and from stakeholders and voices from communities about the need for more attention, education, and funding for harm reduction. ONDCP is counting on this collaboration as we move forward to implement these harm reduction policy priorities in the coming month, months. So just last week, I had the honor of convening our interagency partners to discuss how we can work together to bend the curve of overdose deaths. And I was so pleased to have so many great colleagues from HHS participate, including Dr. Levine, Rachel Pryor from the Office of the Secretary, Dr. Cowery from CDC, Dr. Volkov of NIDA, and many more partners. So finally, let me conclude in my thanks to each of you for making a difference in your communities. I know that the work you do is difficult, but it's essential to the well-being of the entire nation. And my hope is that the addition of voices inside the White House who support harm reduction services, that our shared work will make your efforts to end the HIV epidemic and build trust and engagement with people who use drugs a bit easier. It's long past time that every American impacted by substance use, HIV or both are treated wherever they live, regardless of their background, with the respect and compassion they deserve. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure to speak with you today. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tim Harrison from the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. Thank you. Thank you so much for those wonderful remarks uh, from uh, A.D. Uh, Hayes and A.D. LaBelle. Uh, as was said, uh, I'm Tim Harrison, Deputy Director for Strategic Initiatives and Senior Policy Advisor in the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. Next slide. Uh, before we move on to our, uh, and continue this exciting conversation, I want to do some general housekeeping uh, uh, to continue. Uh, this webinar is audio only and is being recorded. If you have any technical issues, you can reach out to us via the webinar chat feature and we will assist you in a timely manner. For specific questions about the webinar discussion, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of the toolbar. Uh, we are pleased that so many of you have joined us for this learning and sharing opportunity. As a reminder, this webinar is not a press event. The objectives of today's webinar are on your screen. Next slide. We want to take a moment to acknowledge and at an OASH and as well, I'm sure you are terribly excited to welcome our new leadership in the White House Office of National AIDS Policy, uh, Mr. Harold Phillips. Um, and he was very instrumental in, in actually helping put together uh, today's uh, wonderful webinar. Um, and we really appreciate um, his service over here in OIDP for a couple of years and, and really look forward to our collaboration with him um, in the White House Office of National AIDS Policy. Next slide. Let's continue. We have some wonderful speakers here. I'm gonna briefly read uh, their bios and then we can jump right in. Uh, we have Dr. Radana Chandler, who is Director of the AIDS Research Program in the Healing Community Study at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, part of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, as the AIDS Research Program Director, she is responsible for the development planning and coordination of high priority research on HIV, AIDS and drug use within NIDA and across NIH institutes. As the Healing Community Study Director, she is responsible for collaborating on a multi-study addressing the opioid crisis in highly affected communities. Her areas of expertise include research with criminal justice populations, clinical trials, health services research, treatment adherence, and implementing evidence-based treatments. Dr. Chandler earned her PhD in psychology from the University of Kentucky and is a licensed psychologist. And as a cl clinician, she has treated those struggling with addiction, use disorder, and serious mental health issues. We also have Dr. Hansel Tukes, who is Associate Professor, Division of Infectious Diseases from the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine 
uh, Dr. Tooks joined the Faculty of Medicine after completing his residency in internal medicine at Jackson Memorial Hospital. He is the principal investigator of the University of Miami Harm Reduction Research Group, which houses the IDEA, IDEA Exchange, Miami's Needle Exchange Program, the first of its kind in Florida. And last but not least, oh, I should also mention uh, at Jackson Memorial, uh, one of the largest public hospitals in the nation, Dr. Toots works closely with patients living with HIV. He is an advocate for equal access to public health and has extensive experience working with low social economic status patients and patients who use drugs. And then last but certainly not least, we have Robin Whitehead representing Lives and Souls Missional Church and the Hub and Integrated Care Ministry in Atlanta, Georgia. Ms. Whitehead and team live out their vision daily, which is to transform ministry, minds, lives, and souls in order to influence communities and the world in which we live, work, play, learn, and worship. She's excited to share some of the innovative approaches to help reduce disparities and combat social determinants of health in underserved and undervalued communities. I will now turn over the virtual mic to Dr. Chandler. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction and for inviting me to speak today. If you can advance to my first slide, please. Um, so uh, just as a, a way of introduction, NIDA is the second largest funder of HIV research at the National Institutes on Health, which is something that some people are not aware of. Um, and that is a testament to the important role that substance use plays both in um, addressing HIV from a prevention perspective, but also when we consider um, uh, treating individuals who are living with HIV. So I want to talk a little bit about the role of syringe service programs and science and ending uh, the HIV epidemic and whether or not or how science can guide policy. So I'll start out with a brief overview of the evidence base, then talk a little bit about what syringe service program coverage looks like in the United States, drawing on an example from the state of Kentucky, discussing a little bit about our NIDA research portfolio that is currently underway, and then some key takeaway messages. Next slide. So let's start with the evidence base for syringe service programs. It's one of the most robustly studied interventions with over 30 years of research that demonstrates that syringe service programs are safe and are not only associated with decreases in drug use, crime, and syringe litter, um, but that people who participate in syringe service programs rather than increasing their substance use, are five times more likely to enter substance abuse treatment and research consistently has shown that their drug use actually decreases. Syringe service programs are effective in addressing infectious disease outbreaks and in addressing the intertwined public health crises that are related to injecting drugs, including HIV, hepatitis B and C, um, and increasingly have a role that can be played in the opioid overdose fatalities that are occurring across the country. They are cost effective. This was demonstrated in Scott County, Indiana, which unfortunately has recently closed their syringe service program, where halting an ongoing HIV outbreak was credited with saving over $120 million in healthcare costs. And finally, they can be an important venue for delivering EHE and other life-saving services, including naloxone to reduce opioid-related overdoses, HIV and HCV testing and treatment, the provision of PrEP, and medications for opioid use disorder. Next slide. So with regard to EHE specifically, NIDA has funded several studies, and this is one that I'm going to highlight. They used economic modeling across six cities in the United States, including Atlanta, Baltimore, Los Angeles, Miami, New York, and Seattle. And they wanted to assess different combinations of 16 evidence-based practices 
to identify the combination of strategies that will provide the greatest health benefit and be cost effective within those cities, considering unique contextual factors, uh, funding that existed, infrastructure, et cetera, for being able to stand up those 16 evidence-based strategies. Strategies included things like HIV prevention, HIV testing, immediate start of antiretroviral treatments, et cetera. But also syringe services programs, importantly, were included as a part of the 16 combinations and were found to have an important contribution in all six of the cities with regard to reducing the transmission of HIV, and in three cities in particular where they lacked a significant capacity for reach for SSPs were listed as necessary to be able to achieve a cost-effective way to end the HIV epidemic. Those cities included Atlanta, LA, and Miami. Next slide. In another NIDA funded study, investigators examined policy changes that allowed for syringe service program implementation and the impact it had on HIV diagnoses among people who inject drugs in two cities, Philadelphia and Baltimore. Data that you see in figure one on the left shows the forecast of HIV infections that would have occurred over 10 years associated with injection drug use without SSPs in blue and the actual number of HIV cases in orange. Figure two does the same for Baltimore. Again, in this surveillance forecasting work, it demonstrates the high value of syringe service programs and the impact it can have on the spread of HIV. Next slide. And if we needed more, some people who consider him America's doctor, Tony Fauci, even lists clean syringes and speaks about the role of syringe service programs in addition to prevention and treatment of drug and alcohol use as essential components in the toolkit to combat HIV and to achieve EHE goals. Next slide. So we have a robust set of evidence. What does uptake and implementation look like? This slide contains data from 2019 and, um, and, and may be a bit dated, but not by much, and overall indicates whether states have specifically authorized syringe service programs statewide in their legislation. States where local units have interpreted state laws to allow syringe service across services or where no law prohibits syringe exchanges are considered to permit syringe service exchange programs. States with pilot programs, those where syringe syringe exchange would require legislative action and or supportive interpretation of local laws or those where pending exchange legislation is um, go ongoing are considered illegal. State laws were gathered from HIV Prevention Justice Alliance and compared across current syringe exchange program legislation on state government websites to review the accuracy and update to status. So you can see that we still do not have full legality of syringe service programs across the country. And in fact, in some of the areas of the country where we are identifying counties at high risk for HIV outbreaks, um, syringe service programs are, are still not legal. Next slide. So then this slide is from data in 2021 and looks at the total number of syringe exchange programs. And it's from the directory of syringe service programs and it's aggregated by self-reporting to the North American syringe Ex exchange networks. It does not include programs that don't distribute syringes. And again, you can see that portions of the country really lack reach of syringe service programs where there's just not enough of them and where there's not enough to really make a demonstrated and significant impact. Next slide. And unfortunately, syringe service programs are currently under attack in many parts of our country. We've seen recent closures in Scott County, Indiana, which had actually opened a syringe service program a few years ago in response to an HIV outbreak. 
Um, I received a, a news story yesterday about the closure of the Atlantic City syringe service program, um, one of only uh, three in the whole state of New Jersey. Um, West Virginia has passed recent legislation that has put so many requirements and restrictions on syringe service programs that some of them are closing, and West Virginia is currently experiencing an, out, an HIV outbreak, and then in North Carolina and, and other parts of the country. Next slide. So this is just sort of a summary of data that shows in 2021, there are 21 fewer syringe service programs nationwide. West Virginia, um, the state that has consistently ranked highest in drug overdose deaths and is also experiencing an HIV outbreak, only has 12 syringe service programs available. Some have closed or are in the process of closing now, so they have seen declines and are expected to continue to see declines. Um, there are seven states do th that do not have any syringe service exchange programs available. And there is significant need, both because of the types of services that could be provided to um, reduce opioid-related overdose fatalities, like the provision of naloxone, and because of intersecting epidemics of uh, opioid use, as well as HIV and hep C. Next slide. So I wanted to highlight um, the Kentucky example for just a moment. So um, Kentucky provides an example of a state that recognized the intertwined public health crises of opioid use disorder, overdose fatalities, hepatitis C, and HIV, and they acted upon that. And in part, they used the 220 U.S. counties that were identified at risk, many of which were within the state of Kentucky. So they mobilized both people within the policy as well as the advocacy arena, and they had this massive effort to pass legislation and to garner support. And as a result, they currently have 74 operating syringe service programs and other communities that are either in the process or are considering opening syringe service programs. Next slide. So for the Kentucky example, there are a lot of successes. Legislation allowed public health departments to operate syringe service programs. But they did have to do that with the approval of the county boards of health, fiscal courts, and city councils. And so what that really meant was that state legislation was really important, but then that second part of coordination and approval at a local community level also is critical. Um, and so today they have many syringe services programs operating across 63 counties. Next slide. But even in Kentucky, with all of their successes, there is tremendous amount of anxiety currently. Kentucky is one of the states participating in the Healing Community Study, and I interface with researchers, communities, and public health officials every single day. And, and as recently as yesterday, I was on a call with some of their public health officials, and they brought up again this um, anxiety that they are experiencing because of the pressure and the closure of syringe service programs over the past six months across the country. Scott County, Indiana is a specific example that they mentioned because it sits right across the river from Louisville, Kentucky and Jefferson County. Um, so they do have deep concerns. They're watching what's happening in states close to them in the same region, as well as in communities across the country, um, and are trying to really figure out how they can not only have um, levels and information available at the state level, but also within local communities to help them to uh, be able to have a willingness for ongoing support for syringe service programs. Next slide. So NIDA continues to support a very robust portfolio of research around syringe service programs across many areas. Of course, there's great intersection in thinking about the role of SSPs and hepatitis C, as well as uh, many other scientific areas. We have studies looking at feasibility and acceptability of delivering integrated services 
at syringe service programs, and that can include everything from HIV to hepatitis C testing to um, the delivery of naloxone to seeing if individuals would be willing to be referred to treatment, including medication for opioid use disorder. Uh, we've got research continuing to look at barriers and facilitators to syringe service programs across diverse communities. Syringe service programs is a venue for telehealth to provide HIV treatment and medication for opioid use disorder. And then finally, the utilization of syringe service programs as a way to provide information to people who inject drugs on PrEP and to be able to try to connect them to PrEP. Next slide. So a few key takeaways. Um, for me, as I've been thinking about this and put together this presentation and that I want to pass along to you all, first of all, syringe service programs are effective in reducing HIV and other bloodborne infections. They are a really important part of all EHE efforts. However, it's really clear that scientific evidence is only one piece of the puzzle and only one piece of what is needed to be able to see them implemented and very importantly sustained over time. Policy really matters. It matters not only at a federal and state level, but it also matters at local levels because many of these closures that we are seeing in New Jersey and Scott County, Indiana, as an example, are occurring at the local municipal level and not at the larger state level. Federal and state support for SSPs is important and local advocacy is absolutely essential. And efforts to build additional evidence could benefit from really partnering with communities to help understand their unique needs, barriers, successes, and what type of evidence they need to be able to continue to get the support that they need. And federal, state, and local partnerships between HIV and addiction researchers, providers of treatment, and advocates are really important to supporting syringe service programs as a part of ending the HIV epidemic. Thank you very much. So I am Hansel Tooks, and I am going to speak to you about teleharm reduction and mobile syringe services in Miami, Florida. Next slide, please. So we all know that the U.S. South is disproportionately impacted by HIV, and Miami-Dade County ranks number one in new HIV infections. Nationwide, people who inject drugs account for 10% of new HIV infections, truly highlighting the importance of HIV prevention and treatment amongst this. And like Dr. Chandler mentioned, HIV outbreaks in people who inject drugs continue unmitigated in this country. Our go-to evidence-based preventative intervention for HIV, hepatitis C, and injection-related injuries amongst people who inject drugs are syringe services programs. Syringe services programs are community-based programs grounded in harm reduction, a philosophy that respects the autonomy of people who inject drugs and meets them where they are. At their foundation, they provide access to sterile injection equipment and disposal of used syringes. Uh, but we have seen today with the devastating news on the U.S. overdose crisis that there were 93,000 preventable deaths uh, last year, a 30% increase uh, for 2020. So in the U.S. overdose crisis, syringe services programs have expanded to uh, naloxone distribution in addition to HIV and hep C testing, uh, vaccination, as well as wound care. Syringe services programs are expressly identified in ending the HIV epidemic as a cornerstone of the PREVENT pillar, but I would like to show you how they can be leveraged for the other pillars of diagnose, treat, and respond. And decades of evidence have highlighted the effectiveness of these programs for primary HIV prevention, and SSPs have truly become a home base for people who inject drugs. However, prior to 2016, SSPs were express, expressly prohibited by law in the state of Florida. So bringing evidence-based prevention to Florida. So this is a figure from a, a recent paper that I published in Academic Medicine that uh, shows a decade of my life, but I uh, was uh, had the privilege of spearheading the 10-year journey to bring SSPs to my home state. And this is no simple task because the political climate is definitely uh, complex. There were two key translational studies that showed significant need for these programs, primarily in Miami-Dade County. We had a study where we showed 
that was published in 2012 that showed that Miami had eight times the number of improperly discarded syringes on the streets compared to San Francisco, a city with uh, well-established programs. Uh, we took that evidence to the Capitol and we did not get much of a response. So we came back and we looked at our safety net hospital to see the cost of infections related to injection drug use, preventable bacterial infections. And in 2015, we published uh, that that was $11.4 million at Jackson Health System. So the Florida legislature did authorize a five-year pilot, but because it was only a pilot, it was imperative to do rapid evidence-based implementation and evaluation at our program, including statewide analyses so, we, so that we could successfully advocate for expansion of these programs. Uh, you can see here in the graph, that is the number of overdose deaths in Miami-Dade County. The reduction in opioid overdoses uh, was our earliest success and then the outbreak investigation and, and response was our second. I'll come back to the outbreak response later, but I will say that both of these successes led to the authorization of SSP statewide in Florida in 2019. So Senate Bill 242 was the Infectious Disease Elimination Act of 2016 or IDEA where our program got its name. We named it that so that it would not be called the needle bill in the Capitol. It became effective on July 1st, 2016, and it specifically authorized the University of Miami to, operize, uh, to operate a syringe exchange pilot. Importantly, it was an exception to the, uh, the drug paraphernalia statutes, uh, and it made it so that the possession, distribution, or exchange of needles and syringes was no longer a violation of the law. Next slide, please. You can see here our enrollment data from when we opened. We have 1,700 participants and their ethnicities and races reflect the diversity of Miami-Dade County. Of course, we have room for improvement, uh, but we are always working to, to meet more diverse communities. And a lot of that is done through our mobile unit. The services offered at our program include anonymous COVID testing, in addition to HIV and hepatitis C testing, which are all bundled together and we offer in an opt-out manner every three months. We distribute injection equipment, of course, bread and butter HIV prevention, uh, condoms, as well as first aid kits. We spoke about Narcan. We also have a student-run weekly free clinic that does medications for opioid use disorder, as well as wound care. We have a great linkage to care team and we have medication management and pill lockers on site for our patients who are experiencing homelessness or patients who need a safe place to store their medications. Next slide, please. So here is our mobile unit, which was uh, beautifully painted by, by one of our participants to reflect uh, the Wynwood neighborhood of Miami. We launched the mobile unit about six months after the fixed site opened in order to increase our geographic diversity in Miami-Dade County. Um, However, the mobile vans seem to attract people who inject drugs from higher risk and harder to reach groups than the fixed site. We had more women, more African-Americans, higher self-reported baseline hep C seropositivity, lower socioeconomic status, more homelessness, more public injection, and less use of alcohol swabs than on the fixed site. So the mobile unit has been very important for us to reach key demographics in our work. Overdose prevention is a cornerstone. Again, this is a devastating day uh, to have the numbers of uh, overdoses in our country uh, finally revealed, and there's much work to do, everybody on this call and all harm reductionists. Uh, we offer, we were the first street level distribution of naloxone in Florida, uh, and we have uh, had over 2,300 uh, overdose reversals reported to us. The, the community engagement team is the key uh, of our program. They provide a comprehensive hands-on approach to deliver wraparound services. So this can be rapid HIV care via telehealth or what we've coined as teleharm reduction. It includes hep C treatment, medication management and deliveries, uh, linkage to care, telehealth for low barrier medications for opioid use disorder, and an array of case management. We also have an on-site psychologist for mental health services. The medication management is an incredible service. And this we started doing this because we asked participants how we could help them in attaining a viral suppression. And they said, can you store our medications on site? So we have these pill lockers uh, and people can access the pill lockers when they come to uh, exchange syringes. If they don't come in, the team is dispatched and goes out to the field on regular deliveries. And it allows for continued engagement and evaluation of participant needs. We truly bring the medications to our participants. 
So I said I would get back to responding to the Miami outbreak. And this is really showing you how SSPs can be used for diagnosis and treatment, the other pillars of EHE. So if you look at this slide here, X's, uh, there are seven participants here, and the X's are when the participants last tested HIV negative. Their red dot is a reactive test, and the blue dot is when they became virally suppressed. So after implementing our new testing infrastructure, which, which is opt out, we identified these seven acute seroconversions. The average time of linkage to care was 20 days, and the average time from linkage to care to viral suppression was 50 days, so 70 days overall. But we had to create a pathway to HIV care for people who are experiencing homelessness and injecting fentanyl and stimulants. We forged a very strong partnership with the Department of Health, and this was a seismic shift because they had opposed our SSP legislation in the Capitol. But through our strong partnership, all of our participants who were, uh, had acute infections in the investigation were uh, able to achieve viral suppression. And importantly, we asked people how we could help. And that's how we learned about the, the desire to bring HIV care out of the clinic and to the streets, including medication delivery. We've always used a community-based participatory research approach to the development of teleharm reduction. And we always place people who inject drugs at the center. There was a much larger group of people in the investigation, and unfortunately, only 53% of those people who had been previously living with HIV were virally suppressed at the end of the investigation period of 2018. And that is because the traditional healthcare system has completely failed people who inject drugs. And if you look here at the CDC HIV Prevention Progress Report from 2019, um, in 2015, there was only 52.1% viral suppression in this group. And we are far from our 2020 target of 80% viral suppression amongst people who inject drugs. So what barriers exist to viral suppression in people who inject drugs? So if we adapt Merrill Singer's syndemic theory, you can see um, at the center, we have the syndemic health problems of mental health and stigma, substance use disorder, HIV, but the tremendous psychosocial and structural burden has all been exacerbated by COVID-19. So racism, loneliness, lack of transportation, why we go to people, poverty, social, social isolation, pandemic related stress. One bright spot in the pandemic has been the shift to the telehealth delivery of services. And, but even though COVID accelerated the use of telehealth, we had been planning on implementing teleharm reduction uh, since the EHE uh, was launched. We won uh, implementation science planning grants through our Center for AIDS Research and CHARMS AIDS Research Center. And we conducted stakeholder focus groups with decision makers in order to forge a same day pathway to HIV care for people who inject drugs. We also conducted in-depth interviews with our participants to ascertain the acceptability and feasibility. And then we implemented our telehealth protocols. We chose telehealth because it's supported by the Infectious Disease Society of America and it is grounded in evidence. And an evidence, an innovative approach rooted in harm reduction is urgently needed for people who inject drugs. We need to take healthcare out of the traditional healthcare system and to the people, but we must overcome the digital divide so we must innovate. So what is teleharm reduction? It's bringing care to people who inject drugs through technology. Meet people where they're at on their terms, respect their autonomy, and there are decades of evidence of this approach for primary HIV prevention. This is telehealth enhanced on-demand services, basically concierge medicine for people who inject drugs, low barrier access to antiretrovirals, medications for opioid use disorder and hepatitis C treatment. There's mobile phlebotomy so that people can have their labs drawn in the field. There's ongoing harm reduction counseling and medication management. There's also uh, telehealth, mental health and substance use disorder services. And all of these services are delivered via an SSP, via our mobile unit, integrated with the provision of evidence-based naloxone and injection equipment. So next slide, please. So just to hammer at home, the patient is at the center. The peer harm reduction counselor brings the iPad to the patient where he's at and connects him with a physician or psychologist. The physician can prescribe medications, antiretrovirals, 
um, meds for opioid use disorder or HCV cure, which are delivered to the patient with core harm reduction supplies, syringes and naloxone. And there's ongoing motivational interviewing through these processes. It completely sets aside the traditional healthcare system and meets people who inject drugs where they are. And we've seen early success piloting this infrastructure at our program. Next slide, please. The pandemic provided us uh, a natural pilot. So we were able to conduct 43 Ryan White case management teleharm reduction visits. And of course, it's important, you must enroll in Ryan White so that the medical care can be paid for, uh, as well as ADAP enrollment for antiretrovirals. All 43 patients uh, had physician visits uh, with me, and all 43 initiated antiretrovirals uh, on site at the SSP, whether that be on the mobile unit, in a homeless encampment, in a participant's home, where they are. And 33 of these uh, patients are currently undetectable. So we are able to report 80% viral suppression in our pilot program. This was done through 146 HIV care visits, 600 medication drops in the field. We can also do it for medications for opioid use disorder. With the relaxing of the DEA rules, we were able to conduct 80 visits for meds for opioid use disorder via telehealth. I hope those rules remain in place. And our next goal is to integrate all of these specialty pathways of HIV care, medications for opioid use disorder, and hepatitis C treatment through teleharm reduction. Next slide, please. So what we're doing at IDEA is we're really trying to transform the way we practice medicine. We're trying to lay the foundation for an enhanced model of care for people who in inject drugs to become virally suppressed. We want to transform the way people who inject drugs access healthcare and forge a path towards ending the HIV epidemic in this high priority community. Most importantly, we must overcome marginalization and stigma by meeting people who inject drugs where they're at. And with that, I would like to turn it over and introduce Robin Whitehead. Good afternoon and thank you. <clears throat> Again, I'm Robin, Robin Whitehead with Lives and Souls Missional Church and I'm uh, standing in the gap on behalf of Reverend William Francis who had uh, an emergency change in schedules today, but it is very uh, important that we wanted to keep this agenda and share our information. Next slide, please. The vision of Lives and Souls Missional Church is to transform ministry, minds, lives, and souls in order to influence communities in the world in which we live, learn, work, play, and worship. We have a H3 model, which is to provide help, restore hope, allow hearts to heal, and um, in doing so, by providing hope, we, I'm sorry, by providing help, we uh, extend food services, clothing pantries, um, coordinate health screening, syringe exchange, and condom distribution. In restoring hope, we recognize that it's about building up people. And we agree that data is important. However, we want to help prevent the data that is collected. And in doing so, we want to uh, meet the people where they are, which was just shared by the previous uh, the speaker. We allow hearts to heal. Um, we offer support groups and um, set up a healing environment for those who we come in contact and engage with. We all have experienced trauma-informed care, but we wanna move beyond that to healing-centered care. Um, we recognize that we can help but with, with trauma-informed care. People are helping the individuals, but we wanna be able to help the generations. We have experiences and stories and scenarios where not only um, is the individual hurting, but that individual's mom is hurting, her grandmother's hurting, and has the same generational curses that need to be broken um, as we engage not just the individual, but the engagement of the community. Faith-based communities and community-based organizations are often recognized and known for their food pantry, closed closets, health fairs, and even rental assistance. But we wanna move past this to include and engage HIV testing, COVID testing, hep C testing, and so many other services that are important to the communities in which we serve. Um, we want to develop real partnerships. We ask that we are included and invited to the table to create solutions and not just to fix the problems that are presented in our communities. Uh, we're known in, at the Hub uh, or Lives and Souls Ministry, also known as the Hub, 
as for some of our hubisms. <laughs> and one of them is being less transactional and more transformational. As mentioned in the previous slide, um, during the COVID rollout, it would probably have been more beneficial for us to share the info, to have been shared the information um, prior to it going public um, for how they were going to roll out the initiatives for uh, COVID here in the Atlanta area as well as across the nation. Um, we should be aware, and I'm saying we, the faith based community, should be aware of public service announcements prior to them being disseminated to community. So before they hit the broadcasts on the radios or televisions or even billboards, inviting us to be at the table to look at the messaging and the information that's shared in that would be very helpful and in, in, um, informational to uh, informative and informational to us. In addition, here in Atlanta, we have a HOPE initiative, which is the HIV Outreach and Prevention Initiative. Um, we are partnering with local congregations to train on how to end the HIV epidemic. Um, this would have been beneficial and can still be, be beneficial for COVID and other social determinants and disparities that are impacting our communities. At the Hub, um, through Lives and Souls Missional Church, we recognize that there's a seat for everyone at our table. Some of our community, and community tables include homeless individuals, persons with mental health, persons with dealing with substance issues and poverty, um, those who are active or form, former sex workers, same gender loving, so we are inclusive of the LGBTQ community members, multicultural, multicultural multiracial, and multigenerational individuals. We have a saying here that at, uh, at the church, what you see is what you get, and that's what makes us the church. There's a seat for anyone um, at the table, and we're also reminded, as such were some of us, so it's important that we make a seat for everyone um, and not just those who um, have the degrees, have the education, have the know-how, but those who have experience, have life experience to be able to uh, make the shift and pivot in the direction in which we wanna move and occupy and engage the faith community. Next slide. Our goal at the Hub is to establish healthy communities by collaborating, partnering, referring, and making supportive referrals um, with like-minded organizations. Some of our wraparound support services include health and wellness screenings, mental and behavioral health, case management and linkage to care, workforce development or job readiness, housing, financial literacy for credit and debt, transportation assistance, GED, and even college prep. We outsource some of these services as well as have them in-house. And again, collaboration and partnership is key. Everything moves at the speed of relationships, so it's important that we have strong collaborations and partnerships so that when we are looking to identify and offer these support and wraparound services to individuals that are in our care, um, that we are building and moving at the speed of a relationship. We have specific targeted outreach and it is conducted at more than nine locations in the Atlanta metro, uh, metropolitan area, which includes some of our urban, rural, um, urban and rural, rural areas, as well as outside of a Atlanta and even beyond the Georgia, um, Georgia uh, state limits. We've been invited to go into other uh, southern states as well, and we're expanding our MDNA throughout the southeast. Again, as a hubism, the MDNA is another form of missional DNA. Though the hub and Lives and Souls Ministry is a church without walls, we are currently looking for a warehouse to transform, transform into the hubs ORC or our outreach resource center. During the 2020 year and uh, high impact of COVID, we disseminated more than 75,000 meals in the community last year. And in 2021, uh, up until May, we have already distributed 30,000 meals with a count of 1,500 per week. And these are going meals that are going into the community at uh, hotel shelters, extended stay, and even senior meal deliveries. With the new building, um, we would like to be able to open up a thrift store and a co-op, but also be able to have on-site services that are on our schedule because we do recognize um, that services are based upon the hours of operations at local uh, community-based organizations, health departments, and so on. So we wanna be able to make sure that we have something that meets the needs of the individuals and the communities that we serve by having non-practical office hours. Next slide, please. Lives and Souls Missional Church is a ministry that is 
not just communion oriented, but we have communion as well as condoms. We distribute condoms in the community as well as uh, syringe exchange. Um, we have partnered with DeKalb County Board of Health to receive clean needles for our outreach efforts when we're doing needle exchange um, uh, programs um, and has been very successful. We bring the dirty needles that we've collected out in the community during outreach events back to DeKalb County for their disposal and receive clean needles that we can share with individuals um, in, 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 at any given time during any outreach activity or event. We also receive uh, condoms from the Georgia Department of Public Health for distribution. And those are on an ongoing basis. And I do not have the number in regards to quantity at this time, um, but it's very successful. And I can say that it's in the thousands for both syringe exchange and condom distributions. It's important that we keep the model that we want to not only save lives, but save souls. Next slide. Some of our community events, um, walk with me. Uh, here in Atlanta, we started a walk with me program. It launched on Good Friday this past April of 2021, where we were able to distribute more than 300 pairs of shoes to homeless individuals in the metro Atlanta area. We just popped up at a location, got the word out and told them that we, was, uh, that we would be there, um, had some music, a DJ, and Draw the, drew the attention of individuals in the community and they started bringing in others. And again, we distributed more than 300 pairs of shoes to homeless individuals um, on that day. And those were shoes for children, women and men. Um, and we were uh, located just outside of a very large, well-known uh, homeless shelter in the downtown Atlanta area. The street revivals we use for outreach and fundraising. Um, some of the funding that we would collect, we would like to raise for uh, to purchase a mobile unit with showers because we recognize that when we are going into the communities um, that we serve a lot of homeless individuals and we want to be able to provide them with basic needs and necessities like showers, haircuts, um, of, uh, clothing closets and things like that on the uh, mobile unit. So during the street revivals, again, it's just an opportunity for on-site outreach and a fundraising opportunity. Um, like in church, when we pass the, pass the plate or pass the bucket, we wanna be able to just be able to receive on-site donations as well. And then during the gatherings, again, it's another pop-up service. And it's an opportunity for us to go to places that we haven't gone to in the past or that we don't normally frequent um, so that we can assess the needs of that particular community and. Um, recognize the, the, the frequency or the returnability for us to be able to go back to that uh, location um, and engage with the community and those that we may have encountered during a pop-up session. Next slide, please. And everyone wants a return on their investment. Our testing events have yielded double-digit positivity rates in the past, uh, years of, uh, past years of service. Last year, we were able to serve over 75,000 meals to those living with HIV, those experiencing homelessness, and seniors. And again, this was during COVID. Partnered, we partnered to provide accommodations to 100 homeless individuals, again, during COVID, and countless other testimonies. I keep repeating, again, over COVID, during COVID, because there were so many community-based organizations or services that were halted due to the uh, pandemic, but yet, faith-based communities um, are still looking for the church or local congregations for their needs to assist and support them during their times of hardship. Um, so when we're going out into the community and being, being able to provide assistance, it's very important that uh, we do not operate um, on business hours or uh, during the normal you know, time of, of activities and services, but making sure that we are out there in the community and not allowing anything to stop our efforts and outreach. We cannot say to someone that uh, we're closed today or come back tomorrow because we never know if that person is going to be able to make it to us tomorrow. And if they had enough courage to come to us for the help and assistance at that particular time, we wanna be able to really roll up our sleeves and help them at that given moment. Um, one of the things that we was, I was hearing a lot about in previous speakers, um, I wanted to make sure I point out that the faith-based approach, approach is definitely about collaboration, partnership, outreach, and linkage. We can't expect congregations or churches to do it all, but we all have to be able to make the referral, make the linkage, and make the connections to those who are currently doing the work. So I don't have any information about 
the average time for linkage. But I will say that um, at any given moment, we within 24 hours connect individuals who have needs or express uh, requests to us to local services. And then we expect those uh, collaborating partners or persons who are receiving the funding to do the work to do just exactly what they are funded to do. Um, next slide. And again, we cannot say enough about or stress enough about the importance of collaboration. We, we collaborate with it on the federal level, state level, local, uh, local with our health departments, with local aid service organizations, community-based organizations, churches of various denominations and the like. The faith community lacks partnership. Um, oftentimes many uh, who are in the community doing the work, they're looking for numbers, but not necessarily willing to share the funding. Faith-based organizations don't receive the funding to do the work, but we are constantly out there providing services 24 hours a day. Um, so a real partnership is not just us sharing the numbers or giving a, uh, a organization or um, a program a place to do the work, but really being a partner and sharing the funding that comes along with so that we can sustain the services. So after the research is completed, that we can continue with the programming. Next slide. And finally, there was a, a, a testimony or a story that we wanted to share um, that we learned from one of our uh, young ladies that we encountered. Um, we actually ran across Brenda behind a Waffle House here in Atlanta. She was in a bad relationship. In fact, her boyfriend was her pimp. She was an active drug user and an active sex worker. Um, so we had went back just to see, we knew that she was back there and, and approached her one evening um, just to see if she was okay, if we could help her with anything, um, to provide her with any resources, you know, to offer her prayer. Um, and it allowed us an opportunity. She accepted that and we connected her to a substance abuse program here in the Atlanta area. After she successfully completed the program, she was able to um, identify and stabilize an apartment as well as purchase a small vehicle. Everyone knows that here in Atlanta, in order to be successful, in order to get around, you have to have a car. Um, but after I say all that to say that she was very successful. In fact, that she received some dental services that we didn't even recognize her the next time that we had uh, come across Brenda at a local park. Um, she had a pretty smile, her hair had grown out and even he had even changed colors. But she had explained to us that it was because of us stopping, just engaging in a conversation and offering her to help. In fact, when one of the guys who we were with had approached her at, behind that Waffle House, she was ready to perform anything necessary to make a few dollars. And she was embarrassed about that, but she allowed us to continue to um, share what we were there for, you know, to offer and what we were there to do. Um, and because she was willing to hear us and because we were willing to take the step to go into the hedges behind the Waffle House and being you know, on the dock highways here um, in the streets of Atlanta, we were able to save her life and save her soul. Um, she's very thankful and appreciative of what we've done and the turnaround that she has made. She's no longer um, an active sex worker. She's no longer um, engaged in drugs and has gotten her life cleaned up and um, again, is able to sustain her own apartment and drive back and forth to work with a pretty smile. It's a short story, but it's a true story in regards to the impact that we can make if we just go and do what we are called to do. Um, and you can't say that it's past five o'clock, you know, it's after six, but it's where will I go? When will I go? And what is it that we are called to do? So with that, I thank you for allowing us to share what we're doing in the faith community and how we can continue to expand these services, events, and activities. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it back over to Tim Harrison, who we've already heard from earlier today. So there's no introduction needed. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ms. Whitehead, for a very inspirational uh, discussion and a wonderful presentation. And really appreciate you coming on board and stepping up uh, in place of Pastor Francis on short notice. And a special thanks to uh, Drs. Tooks and, and uh, Chandler uh, for your wonderful presentations. Lots to chew on, and I'm sure many of our uh, participants in the audience would love some questions for you shortly. Um, before we pivot to the Q&A section, 
Um, I just want to make a few words of, of updates um, from uh, the perspective of the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Uh, I'll be very brief and then we can get into the Q&A. Um, and it's a good segue in thinking about uh, the conversations we just had. Uh, last month, um, as, as many of you know, we marked 40 years of the HIV epidemic and after decades of progress, we are reminded that our work is not yet finished. And today's discussion around harm reduction and SSPs um, is a big piece of that work that is not yet finished. Uh, we must reflect, re recommit, re-energize, and re-engage our HIV workforce, which includes empowering researchers, scientists, and healthcare providers to ensure equitable, equitable access to prevention, care, and treatment in every community. And in this instance, I would also include our faith communities. Uh, we are reminded of the, the, the goal of ending the HIV epidemic is a all of society, whole of society approach. And today we have listened to uh, representatives from federal government, from public hospitals and, and from our faith communities. And so I really appreciate uh, listening to this uh, conversation. The ending the HIV epidemic in the US remains a priority for the Biden-Harris administration. <clears throat> Excuse me, the president remains committed to help accelerate and strengthen efforts to end the HIV epidemic in the U.S. Federal, state, and local end the HIV epidemic implementing agencies have faced the challenge of continuing critical HIV operations while responding to the emerging needs resulting from COVID. Next slide. OIDP within the Office of the Assistant Secretary is excited to renew its partnership uh, with the newly reconstituted Office of National AIDS Policy and its director, Harold Phillips. Specifically, OIDP, along with our other federal partners, will work with ONAP on its request for a revised HIV plan. HHS will continue the important work begun under the end of the HIV epidemic initiative looking to at this inflection point and the opportunities to tweak, modify, or improve upon our efforts. And this may include working more closely or differently with our federal and local partners and some real assessments of the progress uh, that is needed in all facets. Next slide, please. The Ready, Set, Prep program, uh, many of you are familiar with, has observed a steady increase in enrollment of up to four times the number of participants since October 2020. Additionally, we also noted that it, there has been an 18% increase in unique patients using the program. The expansion of co-sponsoring pharmacies within the Ready, Set, Prep program that donate their services and mail order programs at over 32,000 locations across the United States coupled with the robust communication strategy with the launch of the I Am Ready campaign have been some of the successful elements of the program. We are encouraging continued use of prevention services and the Ready, Set, Prep program serves as a tool in the prevention toolbox that we observed earlier for those in need. Next slide. Uh, as many of you who are on are, are aware, the AHEAD dashboard is a resource that all of us can use to monitor our collective progress in achieving the goals of the End of the HIV initiative. HHS recently updated in late May with new annual and quarterly data released by the CDC. We're excited about a number of new enhancements that will be rolling out in the next weeks and months, including demographic data at the state and local levels, the addition of social determinants of health, new innovative strategies, a request that we heard over and over again from many of our stakeholders, uh, a new user guide, and the opportunity to learn more through one-on-one -on -one personalized TA sessions. Next slide. The HIV plan and the EHE initiative are closely aligned and complementary. They share the overarching goal of reducing new HIV infections in the United States by 90% by 2030. The HIV plan also details four goals to guide both federal 
and non-federal efforts over the next five years, preventing new HIV infections, improve HIV-related health outcomes of people with HIV, reduce HIV-related disparities in health inequities, and achieve integrated and coordinated efforts that address the HIV epidemic among all partners and stakeholders. Next slide, please. I wanted to bring this to your attention uh, uh, as an important piece as we move forward, keeping in mind uh, back in March 2021, uh, President Biden announced the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, is extending access to the special enrollment period until August 15th. Uh, help spread the word, as this will provide new and current enrollees an additional three months to, to enroll or reevaluate their coverage needs with increased tax credits available to reduce premiums. And there's the visit www.healthcare.gov. Www um, and the phone number there is listed as well. Uh, and you can receive free educational materials at the marketplace. And now with the brief updates, I'd like to turn this over to Marissa Robinson, who will help take us through our Q&A. Thank you so much, Tim, and, and a huge virtual round of applause to all of our presenters. Um, today's conversation has been so well thought out and I think well executed. And I just wanna say uh, uh, congratulations to everybody on a, on a great, great session. Um, to start us off, I'm gonna open the floor. Uh, there's several questions and I'm just gonna go ahead and preface that we won't be able to get to everyone's question today with the limited amount of time that we have left in the webinar. But some of the questions we will make sure that the panelists get. Um, and so I just wanted to make that claim. So first things first, um, we had Yolanda. She asked a question about what are the businesses most affected by the presence of an SSP? And I'm going to open that up to our non-federal partners to give us a feedback on what businesses are most affected by the presence of an SSP. Can you repeat that question, please? Sure. What are the businesses most affected by the presence of an SSP? I, I, think I can I'm answer this question. This is this is Hansel Tux. I can answer. So, you know, I'm not trying to make a joke here, but the business that's most affected is the underground sale of syringes. <laughs> and I would piggyback on that. I was going to actually say that I think that it's a matter of not being able to, you know, to be able to have just an exchange, an ego, a clean needle exchange, as opposed to um, the constant rotation of dirty needles, you know, so we're making sure that we're, we're, not, we're not putting anyone out of business because we don't have any competitors. Um, but it's definitely something in regards to having um, an opportunity to give the clean needles when we're doing outreach. Thank you both for that. Um, the next question um, was is uh, from Barbara was, is there a directory or website states can access to identify SSPs in their area? And I'll open that up to the group if anyone knows of any information. The CDC has a website that has a wealth of information about syringe service programs in general, and that also offers some information about where syringe programs are located. So I would refer them first to the CDC website. Um, also, if you go and you look on state public health websites, you can find a lot of information. It varies state by state. For example, Kentucky has a very useful website that lists um, all of the syringe service programs with their addresses and locations. Thank you so much, Dr. Chandler. Does anybody have anything to add to that? Okay. Moving right along, um, and I think some individuals are also um, dropping things in the chat box, so definitely keep monitoring um, that as well. Um, we will make sure that those become available to the group. Um, the, I, I believe National Harm Reduction Coalition has a map of locations um, is what one of the uh, uh, participants said. So thank you for that. Um, the next question is, uh, from Laura, it's what is the best email to use if participants have questions about Ready, Set, Prep, such as finding out which pharmacies are participating at the state level? 
Good question. Uh, I guess I could provide my email um, or someone in our office. Uh, we can we can certainly certainly provide that. And I believe on the site there is a listing of the pharmacies. If you go to hiv.gov, um, um, but I can verify that. But I'm, I'm sure there. We, I know there is a listing. I'm pretty sure that it, it is up there, but uh, we can double check. But if you want to uh, have specific questions beyond that uh, around a ready set prep, you can certainly contact our office. Um, I can provide my, my name and, and email in the chat. Yes, and I was going to also add um, that we have a ready set prep .gov email um, that I will also put in the chat as well. Uh, for those that have ready set prep questions um, and I will share that amongst the group. Um, next, let me see here, I drop that in the chat for everybody. Um, a next question is, um, could someone discuss from Lori, it was, can someone discuss timeline and required legislative changes for allowing purchase of syringes with federal dollars? Okay. I will, we will circle back with you, Lori, on that question. Um, there is also a question um, for the bureaus. Will other bureaus present updates during this call, this call specifically the Bureau of Primary Healthcare? Um, and that was from Isaiah. And uh, to answer your question, um, no, there will not be other bureaus updating today. There should have been a uh, federal agency update handout that was sent about an hour before the, today's webinar. And we will also be having a recap blog that will come out on HIV.gov a few weeks from today. And our next quarterly stakeholder webinar, which the date is TBD, we will be able to have um, the agency's updates. So there will not be any other federal updates in today's webinar. And for our last and final question, um, I open this up to the, um, the group, is if folks don't have access to SSPs currently, where should their first stop be? Um, and I'll open this to all of our panelists. Robin, would you like to go first? Actually, we just started with our local health departments with the County Board of Health. Um, as I mentioned, with DeKalb County, um, we have also reached out to Gwinnett County um, and Fulton County to receive syringes. Uh, but we do most of, work, most of the work in DeKalb. So an ongoing um, collaboration with DeKalb County Board of Health has been successful. Um, and again, because the church is not in the business of needle exchange, um, you know, just that relationship and building those partnerships with them seeing the events and the outreach that we're doing in the community, they were uh, more than happy to, to uh, educate us um, and give us the information that's needed when we're um, doing the exchanges, as well as provide them with a linkage for those individuals that we may encounter to refer them back to DeKalb County Board of Health. Thank you, Robin. Um, Dr. Tukes, do you have anything to add to that? Or Dr. Chandler? I think in some jurisdictions, their uh, pharmacy purchase of syringes is allowed. There are some mail order harm reduction programs like Next Distro, but basically the first place to go should be, well, we, we also know that you know, using an alcohol swab and other things that aren't illegal have uh, tremendous health benefits in preventing bacterial infections, but people need to organize. So we had a coalition uh, in Miami of medical students, mothers uh, who had lost their children to substance use disorders, people who are living with substance use disorders, uh, even law enforcement became part of the coalition Coalition and the state attorney. You need to organize and get together and, and head to the Capitol and advocate for what is right. And uh, you know, with time and tenacity, uh, syringe exchange will become reality in your jurisdiction. Thank you so much. And um, I just wanted to also add that there has been um, a new pot of money, about $30 million under the American Recovery Plan, which allows the purchase of syringes using federal funds. The House proposes to lift the ban on syringes, um, but we're still waiting for this year's budget process to completely play out. So more will be forthcoming um, and just keep your eyes out for that. 
And Dr. Chandler, did you have anything to add before I pivot back to Tim to close out the session? No, I was just going to say one thing important in thinking about where syringes might be available outside of syringe service programs is whether or not the state allows the distribution of syringes. And if they do, as Dr. Tubes pointed out, pharmacies do that in some instances and are a good place. Um, but if your state laws are very prohibitive, then it can be really complicated to be able to do that within the state where an individual resides. Thank you, Dr. Chandler. And thank you everybody who submitted questions. We have noted all of the questions that were in the question and answer box and those that were in the chat function. So we will be able to uh, collaborate on those and get those back out to our presenters. So I will say next slide and turn it back over to Tim for closing remarks. Thanks. Thank you, Marissa. And really a special thanks to our speakers, uh, Dr. Chandler, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Tubbs and Ms. Whitehead for their presentations today. Um, really, I think, helped us to uh, think uh, more in-depthly about uh, the issue of syringe service programs, harm reduction, and the like. Um, and also, uh, a big thank you to all of you who joined this webinar. Uh, we hope that this webinar has provided you with some valuable information on the work related to SSPs and harm reduction, as well as the efforts surrounding the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative. Uh, please also reference the handout that Marissa alluded to, which has some updates that were from our federal partners. And in thinking about um, uh, as we move forward, uh, this has been a rich discussion with lots of information. Syringe service programs are a key component of a comprehensive strategy to combat the nation's opioid crisis and prevent the transmission of infectious diseases through injection drug use. As we look for opportunities to scale up prevention proven strategies and identify new and innovative harm reduction models, we must continue to advance the goal of health equity. And that will likely include new partnerships, culturally and linguistically appropriate approaches, and patient-centered and easily accessible services. Ending HIV in America must be, as we are reminded, a whole of society collaborative effort and that's why SSPs must be a key component of EHE. And here, again, please be sure to visit our Awareness Day pages um, on HIV.gov, uh, where you can find shareable resources from across the federal government, including graphics, logo, fact sheets, videos, and more. Please note the 2021 National HIV Observances listed here. And you can go to www.hiv.gov in the events section, and you will similarly find a page per observance with reusable resources specific to each observance. Thanks again for joining us. We look forward to uh, working, working, engaging you in the future. And uh, we hope to see you at our next webinar. This is the conclusion of today's webinar. Please have a great afternoon.